Welcome to the 53rd Asian Impact Webinar of the Asian Development Bank. It's Friday afternoon, assuming that you won't be reaching for your smartphone using social media to sort out your evening date or check the latest updates from your friends during the webinar might be incorrect, even though we will assure an informative webinar, as indeed more than 4.5 billion users spend on average two and a half hours each day on social media, exemplifying the widespread adoption and significance of social media in our everyday life. As more and more people use social media to receive and share information, social media data become a valuable source of timely and granular information that can be used to map the behavior, opinions, concerns, and expectations of citizens. In turn, social media data can be used to study sentiment, or topics, for example, of concern in society, motivating the core objective of our webinar today, namely leveraging social media to discern the public voice for development. First, we will hear key findings from the special supplement, Mapping the Public Voice for Development, Natural Language Processing of Social Media Text Data of the Key Indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2022, setting the scenery for our discussion. You will find the report via the link that we share via the chat. Second, broadening our perspectives, we will discuss novel paths and opportunities to access and utilize, as well as will elaborate on potentials and future implications of social media analytics for supporting development practice with our panel of experts. With that, let me give the screen to Sharibert Sheng, Associate Professor and Associate Dean at the College of Computer Studies at De La Salle University and main author to walk us through the key messages of the report. Over to you, Shari. Thank you very much, Daniel. It is my pleasure to introduce selected content of the special supplement of the Key Indicators for Asia and Pacific 2022 mapping the public voice for development using so natural language processing of social media text data. This joint work is by Stanley Lawrence, Cedric Basuel, Alisa Villanueva, Padre Saeed, and of course, Daniel Bolo. So why should we pay attention to social media text data to facilitate development? Our motivation stems from the understanding that economic research and policy making depend on timely and granular data. Our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic further heightened the need for real-time and comprehensive information. Social media allows individuals and is used by individuals to share and receive information, and social media has become a valuable source for timely and granular information. Social media can be leveraged to map and track behavior, opinions, concerns, and expectations of citizens, and can be used in policy making to enhance the quality of government by improving civic engagement, citizen participation in government, and customer service. However, the manual analysis of social media text data is tedious, if not impossible, due to its volume and the rate at which that volume increases. Natural language processing, or NLP, is the automated and computational preparation and analysis of text data. NLP can be applied to the study of topics and sentiments in natural language, including social media text data. Given time, we will present selected content for each of these three pillars, starting with a short review of previous applications. In the report, we discussed studies that applied NLP to address the Sustainable Development Goals. Second, the report describes specific NLP techniques, including data processing and data representation, as well as the discussion of libraries and programming procedures to perform NLP. It also discussed NLP techniques such as keyword uh, extraction to identify relevant terms, document clustering to group together similar documents, topic modeling to detect common themes, and text classification to recognize language features. These NLP techniques are showcased in two case studies in the report. This slide shows 
four SDGs that were supported by NLP to discover insights from large volumes of text data. In the interest of time, I will only focus on SDG 1 and SDG 3. On poverty, SDG 1, in a 2017 study by Rohrer in Germany, they wanted to determine the link between life satisfaction and worries. Text classification and topic modeling were used to identify life satisfaction and worries or concerns from 35,000 textual answers coming from the German Socioeconomic Panel Study. Using text classification and topic modeling, they learned that the respondents' main concerns were the health of the family, unemployment, and finding employment. For SDG 3 or health, the study of the team of Schillinger used topic modeling and term frequency to determine health literacy of diabetes patients. They process more than 280,000 secure messages sent by almost 7,000 diabetes patients to physicians. Topic modeling was used to identify a population or an individual patient's health literacy or their capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and to make appropriate health decisions. The results showed that one, specific diseases contributed to poor literacy, and second, greater comorbidity was associated to literacy factors. Knowing the benefits of processing unstructured text data, let's go to the technique that can process the abundant high volume text data found on social media. What is natural language processing or NLP? NLP refers to that branch in computer science or more specifically the branch of artificial intelligence or AI that is concerned with giving the computer the ability to understand text and spoken words in much the same way as we humans do. NLP combines computational linguistics, which is the rule-based modeling of human language with statistical and machine learning. Together, these technologies enable the computers to process human language in the form of text or voice data, making computers understand, uh, quote unquote, understand the language meaning or words complete with the speaker's or the writer's intent and sentiment. These techniques we shared in the report focus on the processing of text data. Our report discussed these four NLP techniques as shown on the slide. Keyword extraction can be used to identify relevant terms. Document clustering can group together similar documents. Topic modeling detects latent or hidden themes within and between documents. Finally, sentiment analysis categorizes text based on its contextual polarity or sentiment orientation. In the interest of time, we focus today only on topic modeling. If we want to detect word patterns within and between documents, topic modeling is the preferred NLP technique. And topic modeling is performed through the latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA. We prepared a video to simulate how topic modeling works. So let's watch the video. So topic modeling discovers knowledge and relationships that are concealed within and between documents. LDA has two assumptions. First, each document is described by a distribution of topics. And second, each topic is described by a distribution of words. How does LDA extract the topics? It's a three-step process. First, given the number of topics, each word in the document is randomly assigned the topic, which is represented by a color in this animation. Then, the topic assignments are adjusted by multiplying two conditional probabilities. These are the probability of a topic given a document and the probability of a word given the topic. Then, that update process is repeated to all the words in the document and to all the documents in the corpus. Eventually, we will have a set of words describing each topic. These topics can then be manually interpreted 
and given labels such as this. Here is a visualization of how documents are represented by a mixture of topics as seen by the colors of the words in the document. And on the left side of the slide, it shows how each topic is characterized by a distribution over words. This image is lifted from the paper of David Blay, the author of LDA. We use topic modeling or LDA in our case study to analyze the climate change related tweets that were posted from Australia. Our case study aims to map public conversations on climate change in Australia using social media text data. Our data was sourced from the Twitter historical power pack API and were collected from August to December 2021. The collected tweets should be geotagged to have come from Australia and were posted from January 15 to December 13, 2021. The tweets contained the words climate change, global warming, hashtag climate change, or hashtag global warming. The tweets were pre-processed to convert the unstructured social media text data into meaningful text corpus. We cleaned the data by transforming or removing elements that were not relevant for analysis. So the data preparation was a five-step approach. First, duplicate tweets were removed. Second, non-word tokens such as URLs were converted to special tokens. Then the URLs were moved to another file for further processing, if needed. Then the special tokens were also removed. Then email addresses and special characters were removed. Fourth, the data was further processed through lemmatization or the process of transforming words to their root words. The tweets were also spell-checked and converted to lowercase. We were, all, we're, we were able to perform spell checking and lemmatization because the tweets were written in English. And finally, we identified and removed the stop words based on the most frequently occurring terms. The final data set contained 8,302 tweets coming from 2,495 unique users. So we set the number of topics to 15. We presented in the report our modeling experiments using various numbers of topics to compare the topic coherence stores, scores. While the topic coherence scores did increase when the number of topics were higher than 15, we found that the, general, the generated topics were already overlapping and it's an indicator that the, there were too many topics that were being generated. So we found 15 topics to be a good balance of an unacceptable of an acceptable topic coherence score and good number of quality topics. Okay, so the output of the LDA is a set of words representing each of the fifteen topics as shown on the table on the right. Uh, then our team reviewed the words in each topic and interpreted them by giving them labels as shown on the left side of the slide. For example, for topic one, it is described by the words need action time real great world let big help work happen bad covid way stop thing long look lead lot save australia start nuclear tank pandemic deal power energy bushfire we labeled topic one as timely action immediate action or call to action and we did the same review and labeling process for all 15 topics. This slide shows the first eight topics. And then the next slide shows the remaining topics 9 to 15. We learned from this case study that LDA topic models allow a comprehensive mapping of topics. Specifically, LDA can identify topics in unstructured social media text data. Thus, LDA enables the drawing of conclusions about communication in social media. Second, based on the topics generated, we found public discourse on climate change in Australia focuses on policy making and contributions of society. For example, topic two was on identifying or reporting needs or problems to government and communication between people and government and finding solutions while topic six was about the impact of elections and demand for policy measures or intervention. 
And topic 15 was about truth-seeking and the debate about the truth on climate change. Third, that we discovered that the identified topics on climate change for Australia allow not only to reflect on the concerns, ideas, and expectations of the public, but they allow for the development of approaches and measures to tackle climate change. And this necessitates a joint dialogue between all social groups and remains a fundamental responsibility of the entire society. Thank you very much for this opportunity to introduce the special supplement of the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2022. I look forward to a stimulating and inspiring discussion. Back to you, Daniel. Thank you very much for summarizing the key findings of this year's Key Indicators Special Supplement, Shari, setting the stage for our discussion with our fantastic collection of panelists, namely uh, Tobias Schlager, Professor at the Department of Marketing at the University of Lausanne, Sherwin Owner, Associate Professor and the former Chairperson of the Department of Political Science and Development Studies at De La Salle University, Josephine Armeda, Executive Director at the Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute, and Stephen Wan, Senior Research Scientist and Leader of the Language and Social Computing Team at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. The discussion will allow you to actively engage in the discussion, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat box and we will try to address them appropriately. We learned about the value of social media analytics, also based on the case studies. And in fact, several analysis methods are already applied in practice and unfold their power. Stephen, you worked on a number of applications in collaboration with the Australian government. May I kindly ask you to share your insights on these applications? maybe using an example with a focus on their use case and analytical approach. Thank you very much in advance. Yes, um, thanks, Daniel. Yes, we have uh, applied our natural language processing uh, methods in a number of different areas. Uh, for example, we've worked with uh, social media data uh, for detecting emergencies. For example, um, in Australia, one of the things that we're uh, interested in is earthquakes and, and bushfires. And uh, social media can be a very interesting source for the coordination of the emergency services when responding to such crises. Another area that we've used uh, natural language processing methods and social media analytics uh, is the detection of disease outbreaks like uh, flu or COVID. And here, uh, in these areas, we're using natural language processing uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, the first is to, for example, to filter the content. So no matter what the data science is that we're doing with the social media, when we collect social media, a lot of it is, is going to um, maybe have the keywords, but it might not all be relevant. So one thing we might want to do, first of all, is filter the data uh, to look at uh, the relevant uh, subset for our Purposes. For example, if you're looking at disease outbreak, when somebody tweets the word uh, sneeze, you know, that's a symptom of, of a disease, uh, potentially, uh, it might be that they don't mean this as a symptom, maybe they are referring to a, a metaphorical uh, or a cultural sense of the word. And so we may not necessarily want to include that in our analysis. So natural language processing can be useful for that. Um, it can be also uh, useful in supporting the anomaly detection mechanisms that we are using. So we are interested in uh, cases where people are using these words, but in, in a way and in a, uh, in a volume that is unexpected uh, based on our background models. And that may suggest that something unusual is taking place. So for example, when people talk about an earthquake or earthquake related um, content, um, and it's, uh, there's a burst of activity, that may suggest that there is a crisis going on. So of course, with things like earthquakes, there are other sensors uh, and data sources where we can detect the earthquakes, but social media provides a complementary uh, signal, I guess, to these other sources. So that's one aspect of how we use social media. I guess just to briefly sketch out some of our other work, we often collaborate with librarians and archivists to collect social media data for um, other, uh, to support the research 
uh, work in other disciplines like uh, the social sciences. Um, and we've worked with social scientists and mental health professionals in the past to explore the use of social media data for their downstream research. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, very interesting. Also considering uh, your, your point on knowledge transfer uh, between uh, different uh, disciplines. Uh, so these insights are, are really interesting and provide us with a good indication on the relevance of social media analytics for policy. Um, thereby, the analytical approach appears to be of particular relevance for the application. Um, Josefina, you are engaged in statistical research and training for the improvement of the quality of statistical information in the Philippines. May I kindly ask you to share your perspectives um, on relevant and promising methods used and if possible, also what determines the selection of the method and potential use for development? Thank you. A relevant and a promising method is what was discussed by Chari, is what we call topic modeling. Okay, so I'd like to expound on this more. Topic modeling is actually an unsupervised learning approach, which uncovers hidden structure in text. And the model identifies the topics by detecting the patterns such as word clusters and frequencies. So for instance, when we think of entertainment as the topic, the words that come to mind are movies, sitcoms, web series, Netflix, YouTube, and so on. So a model is trained to automatically discover topics appearing in documents and is thus referred to as topic model. So topic modeling algorithms are actually statistical methods. And this analyzes the words of the original text to discover the topics that ran through them, how those topics are connected to each other, and how they change over time. So let's say we take positive sentiment, which pictures, services, or events are making the customers happy, or for negative sentiment, what features or services are making the customers sad or angry. So identification of topics will be more accurate if the reviews are first segregated by sentiment and then applied to topic modeling. So also for a more accurate identification of topics by sentiment, it is also important that each review text matches the rating. So what are good examples of topic modeling? As mentioned by Cherry, one is the latent Dirichlet allocation or LDA. We also have the Gibbs sampling for Dirichlet mix model or GSDMM, and also the embedded topic modeling or EPM. So I will focus now on GSDMM because Cherry already explained LGA in detail. GSDMM is more of the clustering of text and the optimal number of topics is the emphasis. And um, ETM on the other hand, or embedded topic modeling is actually combining the good properties of traditional topic modeling and good properties of word embeddings. And what is the consideration in the selection of the method? One is what we call high coherence score. So meaning to say when you apply these methodologies, then they should have high coherence score in generating the coherent topics. And I'd like to end by saying also that topic modeling allows the detection of sarcasm. So the discovered sarcastic reviews may either be validated or refuted by the discovered topic models. So I hope that was helpful, Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Josefina. Uh, these considerations are decisive when it comes to the selection of, of the method and um, offers food for thoughts for the weekend. Um, at the same time, uh, social media data and analytics often impose challenges to the research team. Uh, so Sherwin, you collected valuable experiences 
particularly at the intersection between social media analytics and political sciences and development studies. Um, may I ask you to share your experiences and, uh, if possible, two key takeaways that should be considered for projects on social media analytics. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Daniel, for having me. First of all, um, congratulations to the team and, of course, to Charibet, Dr. Charibet, for an insightful presentation. Um, I, I'm totally in, uh, I totally agree with the deterministic nature of technology, um, the emphasis of um, the power of analytics, efficiency, and its ability to collect uh, voluminous data is really, uh, uh, you know, awesome, to, so to speak. But um, if we're talking about mainstreaming, when we talk about adoption, these are terms related to development and even in political science, then um, we cannot help but consider what I call the dark side of technology. Um, when we talk of social media, of course, we know the benefits of social media, but there is a dark side to it. And what is that dark side? The side of misinformation, for instance, um, the side of marginalization, the occurrence of marginalization, and the possibility of control of information. There is also this aspect of security and privacy. And of course, the ethical aspect of asking who is to benefit, who is the referent object. Now, um, you know, aside from a technical model, well, uh, a determinist technology deterministic model, um, I suggest, and of course, this is my opinion, that um, you know, future studies or future endeavor in this area should also look at um, how this will be mainstreamed. So what I mean by that is a possibility of looking at possible governance structures. For instance, how, how do we now identify um, legitimate stakeholders in this ecosystem? Um, who are the people participating? Whose data are we collecting? Another aspect of this, if we really want to enlarge this ecosystem is of course um and to avoid the dark side or minimize the effect the occurrence of the dark side is the idea of institutionalization um uh, when i say institutionalization i'm just i'm not just talking of government but i'm talking of structures i'm talking of rules and perhaps um we can view this and this is just again uh, my take on it we can view this as data as a common resource. In this case, if we adopt this, then um, it is imperative for us to have some sort of rules, some sort of governing mechanism that will ensure equitable access and use of these types of technologies. I think that's it for me, uh, Daniel, and thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Sherman. Um, these perspectives are highly appreciated uh, and definitely carve out and show the relevant steps to be considered to uh, increase the validity, but also the public acceptance of social media analytics. Um, not surprisingly, also in this context, data integration appears to be of particular significance. Um, Tobias, uh, you worked on several projects on social media analytics, ranging from basic research to high impact uh, projects with uh, practitioners, uh, in which data integration is often a, a concern or a challenge. Uh, may I ask you to share your uh, thoughts on data integration? Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, also thank you very much for the um, uh, great opinions and, and uh, points of the other speakers. I think there were some excellent points already. Now, um, while text analysis, I think, has really undergone an impressive development, I think integration and uh, integration of other data modalities uh, should not be forgotten, right? So one of the issues sometimes that we at least have come across uh, when considering uh, primarily text data in isolation is that uh, despite this impressive development, um, text only 
might not always account uh, for precisely account at least for what people may want to express. So in other words, the meaning of some specific comments may partly be ambiguous. And uh, so for instance, also like quantitative indicators as retweets and so forth. So everything you can gather and collect on uh, social media. And uh, this led, uh, or this led us to um, our thought that some of those analysis might require further justification and examination, and really highlights the integration of additional data, of additional data modalities uh, beyond just text data. So um, one example like um, that we have uh, very much worked on in the past two years are emojis. So emojis, I think uh, everybody knows them. They're said to be the largest linguistic development in the or of the past decades. And in a nutshell, they are little images that are added to the text. They can express moods, uh, they can express feelings, but also can act as surrogates for objects, for instance, cars, right? And interestingly, uh, emojis are so theoretically classified as text. So they have specific indicators and we know exactly like which emojis are of course used, even though for people, on the other hand, they are processed as images and can express uh, some things very specifically. So the huge advantage actually of um, taking the case of emojis is that they are rather simple and they're extremely good or extremely well suited uh, for expressing objects, feelings of people. Um, so uh, while they can be better able to describe very precisely the meaning of a specific comment on social media, we thus far had only limited analytical possibilities to really make sense of the impact on online conversations. To increase or to tackle this challenge, um, we established a dictionary uh, of emojis using surveys, additional manual coding, verified all those uh, different emojis. So we had a database of I think the most common 500 emojis and the results like when accounting for these additional data modalities, uh, so emojis was quite interesting. We found that emojis can really increase the flow of text-based communications because people really understand each other much better when adding these little surrogates for things. And we realized that even accounting for emojis can make a difference when analyzing text data. Sometimes emojis in isolation um, were even better able to predict the meaning of a comment than the text in isolation. So quite some impressive um, addition, I think, to, to text analysis, just like as this example. Of course, like when taking this on a broader level, um, it's not only emojis, it's also like voice-based comments uh, that can be added, uh, images, uh, videos, which all add to the meaning of uh, social media. So beyond, uh, beyond text. And I think this is uh, quite quite important to account for that. Thanks, Tobias. Um, very interesting. Uh, and let me expand on one topic. You mentioned the relevance of different uh, data opportunities and touch base the diversity of social media data, also using your example of emojis. Uh, may I ask you to elaborate on these alternative data sources and their value for social media analytics in a bit more detail and as one specific follow-up question regarding your um, dictionary of emojis may I ask if it is also available for other researchers or is it part of a publication that you are working on um, but this is more uh, a minor question on the side thanks yes absolutely so um, we're currently working on the publication and uh, after that of course we will make it available I think um, uh, making available uh, such things that can really benefit uh, other researchers is really vital to uh, progress uh, in, in, in such analytics, of course. Now, uh, coming back to the question of alternative data sources that you have just, um, uh, have just asked. So even when analyzing social media data with the latest methods, and again, like impressive development, I think additional data, and some were already mentioned by the other panelists, uh, beyond social media data has become vital. In isolation, I think social media data often does not afford telling the whole story. So uh, beyond social media data, for instance, 
from one social media channel. The first stage in my eyes is also looking at various social media channels or social media platforms. For instance, Twitter might in some cases be biased. Uh, just looking for instance uh, at uh, Switzerland where every, only very few and very specific people use a specific social media channel. Uh, I think one should go beyond that. Of course, it is a challenge to get data from uh, from other social media platforms. Uh, the access is not always like very easy and very restricted, but it can really add a value to uh, uh, analyzing just uh, Twitter data. On the second stage, um, I would also think about like complementing data from social media with other types of data. So really like other sources, uh, entirely other sources. I'm thinking about like people's comments to online newspaper articles. So we had some projects about that. We I think about behavioral data, for instance, on traffic, which can partly obtained uh, via Google, of course. Uh, the interests of people or the, the focus of the people, which can be expressed by the Google search volume, for instance. Um, or even more macro data, such as data uh, about how weather changes, um, about uh, how the COVID incidence rates changes. Like bringing this all together gives a much more complete image of um, what is actually going on. So just to give you an example, so for one project, we combined the location of the Hurricane Irma, so which was approaching uh, the US a couple of years ago, and uh, combined this with social media data. And we observed that when the storm came in, of course, uh, social media reacted and responded. So people on social media responded entirely differently in terms of their sentiments, in terms of the topics, very similar to what, uh, what was mentioned before by uh, the other panelists. And again, like to really make sense of social media data, I believe that other data um, sources can be extremely helpful in order to, to really make, uh, make uh, sense of the data. In this case, like the weather stations and the location of the hurricane Irma. More generally speaking, the real-time integration of additional data allows us to really uh, get a deeper understanding of also what people then say on social media and really unleashes the entire value of, uh, of this type of data. Thanks, Tobias. Uh, these insights are of paramount significance for future research, also considering novel modalities and types of individual articulation and expression. Um, at the same time, diverse data streams and increasing methodological complexity also remind us uh, on the various trade-offs in social media analytics. Um, Sherwin, you have dealt with these questions uh, in, in, in great detail. May I ask you to share your uh, intuitions and your perspectives on this topic? Thank you. Right, I've been looking at the questions being posted. Um, but before we, we address that, I would like to uh, take away from uh, Professor Tobias' point that um, considering various data streams is another uh, option. Uh, you know, just to give an example, um, for instance, in disaster response or even public health emergencies, um, responders or even incident commanders will not respond to social media analytics. They will say that this is not actionable information and that is for their use as ground responders. So really, I, I agree with that point that there is a need really to... Um, uh, to uh, identify additional data streams uh, that can uh, support the position of uh, the results of uh, social media analytics. On the other hand, there is a danger to that. No? We, we need to look at, um, you mentioned policymaking. Um, the openness of policymakers, of course, is another, is another uh, concern. Um, do policymakers really believe on social media analytics. I guess um, uh, that is uh, a tall order uh, since um, uh, social media analytics is, is just a new field. And perhaps uh, this can be introduced in various uh, venues, uh, especially in public administration uh, venues. Thanks, that's all, Daniel. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sherwin. Uh, and indeed, these uh, trade-offs should be considered uh, carefully uh, in the research uh, agenda uh, and appropriately addressed in the research uh, design. Uh, by the way, if you have a specific question that you'd like to focus on later, we have a, a couple of minutes, so please feel free uh, to, to decide for a question and to answer uh, it uh, later. Um, Stephen, uh, I'd like to uh, bring you uh, in 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 this context, uh, based on your profound expertise uh, at the intersection between research and practice, and that was mentioned by uh, Sherwin, that, that we have to better understand the link and to make the transition from insight to impact. May I kindly ask you for your thoughts on best practices and approaches uh, to work um, with uh, social media data to derive valid insights that can then be further used also by policymakers or other interested uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I want to say uh, I'm really enjoying the discussion and many of the points that I'm about to, I was thinking of making, have already been made. Uh, so con considering uh, what it is that the, the end user of the social media analytics really needs to take away, um, how are they going to view the data, view the uh, validity of the analysis, uh, that these are things we really do need to consider. Um, I, when I was thinking about this beforehand, I guess I, I had sort of three three things I wanted to mention. And having worked in this space now for, for over 10 years, uh, one thing that I've noticed is uh, what is available through the technology platforms from social media companies uh, has changed dramatically over these 10 years. The things that we could do um, when, when I first started out in this area in 2009 with, with government who were interested in, in um, doing the pursuing government 2.0, which was a, a, a movement that followed on from web 2.0 to see if there was a way to, to deliver services, government services better uh, by listening to, to, to what people needed. Some of these things uh, really shaped the way that we, we worked uh, with the data and the analytics, but some of those uh, uh, possibilities back then, they're, they're no longer available now. And it's because the platforms have changed the way they're offering the data. And that is, I think, due to the evolving uh, space here and the evolving way that we think about these important topics. Uh, I think things, uh, ethics, privacy was mentioned earlier. And so these, we're changing the ways that we think about these things. And so the technology offering is different too. Um, from a research and engineering perspective, um, I think the second takeaway message that I'd like us to think about is some of the decisions that we make from an engineering perspective or a research perspective, they will introduce a bias potentially in the data sets we collect. So if I decided to use a particular API, what data am I collecting? Um, and is that suitable for the end analysis? Or if I have a uh, particular engineering approach, software engineering approach, am I somehow constraining the data that I'm getting? And, and am I aware of this when I do my analysis? So it's good to think about the decisions that we make from a research and software engineering perspective to see what kind of effects that has on our analysis. And then, oops, uh, apologies, the light's gone out. And the kinds of effects that um, will that will have on our policy um, that comes as results of the uh, from that analysis. And finally, I guess the third thing is um, the work that we do is multidisciplinary. So it, it's important to to um, to consider that to consider the different viewpoints to understand. Um, you know, for myself, I'm a data scientist and a natural language processing researcher. But what is it that the social scientist needs or the mental health researcher needs? And uh, it was mentioned before, we need to fuse different data sets together. So again, thinking about how our social media analytics, um, what role does it play with in terms of the end goal of, of that data scientist? And what do we need to mix, fuse it with? So again, data fusion was mentioned before. Um, social media is great, it's timely, but it doesn't necessarily have all the information that we need to, to have an impact in the real world. So those, I guess, are the three things I would consider. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, these insights are of great value, also considering uh, the required transition from case studies to large-scale implementation. 
And in this context, um, capacity building is of particular importance. Knowledge sharing and training is continuously increasing in importance. Uh, Josefina, may I kindly ask uh, you uh, for your expertise uh, perspectives on it? And if possible, can you elaborate on strategies for knowledge sharing and approaches, given that this is one of the key pillars of uh, your institute and daily work? Thank you. Okay, you're very correct, Daniel, that one good strategy for knowledge sharing is capacity building or training in social media analytics. And what are the topics that can be included in the training program design of social media analytics? Since there is a need to collect and manage data from various online platforms, wherein we do web scraping, then we need to do a lot of computer programming. So like teaching people how to use Python programming language, okay? And also, since it will entail sentiment analysis, which also entails a lot of coding. So it will involve a lot of programming skills. Now, in terms of text mining, we can use software, statistical software, or also the use of R to do exploratory data analysis, like doing data visualizations, computing for correlations, and building up models like in the regression analysis, okay? So it will be good to expose people how to look at words and text, okay? Initially, we can probably tell them how to do counts, <laughs> right? Because it will entail really good programming skills. So also, let us have topics on the legal, privacy, and security issues, okay? when we do such analysis. Now, I'd like to share also, Daniel, and to everyone, some best practices in social media analytics. So one is data centralization for social media. And what do I mean by this? Maintaining a unified platform that collects data from any network to ensure that data is centralized. Okay, sometimes we have to web scrape in all in all areas, right? So it would be nice to have a centralized data. And then secondly, to identify the right metrics that will track the goals, okay? Third is to use or to choose the right social media analytics tool that will complement the goal. And fourth, we need to use a simple, okay, take note, simple, social media analysis report template, okay? Because there are so many suggestions in the internet, right? But what do we need to consider? One that will give us insights on a higher level, but will also provide detailed information, okay? And lastly, if you are to implement changes on our social media strategy, let us all base it on analytics. Okay, so those are the best practices that we can follow or serve as a guide. And that's it for me now, Daniel. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josefina. And this is a perfect gateway to further integrating feedback and questions from our participants. And we received a lot of questions um, and maybe we can address two or three of them. Um, I think one was answered. Um, by by your statement regarding uh, trainings and uh, activities offered uh, by your institute uh, and that can be uh, accessed by uh, the, the general public. Um, but there was one question um, regarding the increasing complexity and volume um, of data. Um, Sherwin, may I ask you to um, try to answer the question from uh, Zakaria on uh, this uh, particular uh, topic and how to deal with that. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Daniel. I saw this question earlier and got me excited, mm -hmm. honestly. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'll just limit my question, uh, my, my answer, sorry. To answer this, uh, Zakaria, I would like to go back to the point I mentioned earlier uh, for the need uh, for a roadmap, a governance roadmap. 
uh, for uh, data analytics or social media analytics. Um, this roadmap should take into consideration, for instance, um, who are the legitimate stakeholders in this, this ecosystem, this development ecosystem, if you want to refer to it that way. Um, you know, guys, we need to bite the bullet on this. Uh, <laughs> we need to know the, the space, the ecosystem. Um, if you want to view it as a development space or even a data analytics space, but we need to know who we are dealing with and the legitimate development questions that uh, we can answer. Next, of course, is to um, have institutions in place. Um, I explained this earlier that um, by having institutions, you are now, um, you must be now ready to establish rules procedures, and even ethics, uh, even competencies uh, on this subject matter. And, you know, that, that can, um, you know, in, in my opinion, that can filter this, this voluminous, this legend of voluminous data and make it more purposeful and make it ready for adoption. That's it, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Shervin. Very helpful. Um, another question in a related but different uh, context at the end relates to identifying um, fake accounts and related uh, constructs. Um, uh, Shari, um, also given our previous and your previous work on the subject matter, may I ask you to share your uh, perspectives uh, on that one? Thanks. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the internet's participatory culture can be exploited and to shape the narratives and opinions. And uh, we, see this, we see this in uh, trolls, the fake accounts. Uh, people may post or interact with specific messages to intentionally increase a message's influence. Uh, and these actions may possibly be coordinated in, on purpose. Uh, through the use of bots. And it is a big, big challenge. And as Stephen pointed out earlier, uh, the technologies that we have today also adjust because of how these technologies, how people are using these technologies. Um, one way maybe to address it is AI, there's now a lot of research uh, trying to uh, identify accounts that are supposedly fake or are spewing uh, negativity in the platform. So that can be done by AI and uh, specifically also NLP in the analysis of the text. Um, another way would be to consider uh, other data sources, as pointed out uh, by Tobias and Stephen. Uh, there are other data sources and other data modalities to assist in the uh, making whatever insights gathered from social media to be to be enriched and validated, as well as to detect any anomalies that are there in the data. Um, to do that manually is very difficult, which is why uh, there must be an automated way using technology to to overcome these challenges. Well noted. Thank you very much, uh, Shari, for the uh, very informative uh, reply. Um, we have uh, another question that relates to the applications of social media analytics beyond academia, beyond research. Uh, and I'd like to bring two persons to the table, maybe Stephen and Tobias. Maybe you can reply uh, in brief. Um, Stephen, maybe something related to your experience with the government beyond academia, but also from um, the private sector perspective, because some of the change is actually driven by um, uh, large-scale companies that work with social media analytics. Maybe, Tobias, you can also share your perspectives in brief on that one. Maybe you can, we can start with, uh, with uh, Stephen and then turn over to Tobias. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, and I, I guess our experience has mostly been with uh, government bodies interested in, in uh, working with social media because, uh, as we mentioned earlier, it's real-time data, it's, uh, it's freely uh, volunteered the information, uh, so it's unsolicited, and, and I guess this is in contrast to things like um, uh, interview or questionnaire um, uh, methods where you are asking a, a directed question, and so that can um, 
uh, affect the way that the participant responds. So uh, governments are very much interested in, uh, in understanding that, particularly in understanding how people um, uh, uh, talk about certain uh, social issues. So just to follow on um, from um, the question about fake um, social media before, yeah, we, we do want to detect it and we have to be very careful about how we treat it. But um, if, when there's misinformation on, on, the, on the web about particular topics, sometimes uh, say a, a health department might want to know about this in advance so that they can uh, better provide health uh, service information. So knowing about how, what kinds of misinformation is spreading on, online is useful then for the people who are creating these public health um, in, information um, uh, services. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, Tobias, may I ask you if you have experiences and or perspectives on uh, other sectors um, that, that are using social media data and analytics? Thanks. Absolutely. Um, so companies nowadays, I think they have really realized that social media data is, is, is extremely important um, just to have their, their finger on the pulse of what their customers say. So we worked quite with some companies um, uh, to improve their social media analytics. And, and we really saw that many companies were still like quite deficient in, uh, in uh, how they actually use social media data. And um, I think one typical example that is always of interest for uh, companies is uh, when it gets to uh, shit storms on social media. So typically like negative opinions about a company that are then amplified and that can really um, uh, be, uh, yeah, be a danger for the reputation of the company. And uh, identifying early. So we, we worked on a project that allowed us to very early identify which tweets, uh, which comments on social media might uh, lead to, to such uh, shit storms, to such negative movements um, is absolutely important for companies and preventing and early, uh, early uh, identifying those comments and then counteracting, commenting on the right comments that could be dangerous for those companies is of course um, very important. So the responses to uh, social media uh, comments, so using again, like analysis, text analysis, uh, the ratio between number of likes and, uh, uh, and um, yeah, the, the answers and so forth is really a great opportunity for companies. And I think this um, will uh, be much more sophisticated, of course, in future. So there's much to learn also for companies still. Great. Thank you very much, Tobias. Um, yeah, we are close uh, to the end. I try to follow up with some of the questions following our webinar. For the moment, thank you very much for your participation, in particular, Shari, for sharing valuable insights of the special supplement of the key indicators for Asia and the Pacific 2022, and Tobias, Sherwin, Josefina, and Stephen for the inspiring panel discussion on leveraging social media to discern the public voice for development, as well as Mel and her team for organizing the webinar. Beyond the webinar today, please join us again in the next Asian Impact webinar entitled Transforming Bangladesh Participation in Trade and Global Value Chains on October 20 at 10 a.m. Manila time via Zoom. The registration details will be available soon via the Asian Impact webinar webpage and the ADB Chief Economists, and now we make the loop, Twitter account. Let me conclude with a personal note. At the end, it's a community of committed and responsibly acting individuals that can make an impact based on the virtual footprints of others, requiring qualitative insights, participatory approaches, and potentially most important, a joint dialogue for which the AIW hopefully sets the stage. With that, please feel free to reach out to us in case of further questions, and you may now continue with your social media. Hashtag winking face, Thank you very much. Stay safe and happy weekend.